Hey, and welcome to the lecture. Before we jump into the learning, just a quick reminder to check out the workbooks available on modernoptician.com through the Ultimate Apprentice Optician Study Guide or available on Amazon worldwide. It's the best way to accompany this lecture so that you can fill in the blanks, label the diagrams, do everything all concurrently and elevate your training to the next level. All the links to the workbooks and the website are all in the description down below, so make sure to check it out. Other than that, enjoy today's lesson. All right, moving on. We are now going to be talking about corneal pathologies. We've talked about some intraocular pathologies. Now we're going to talk about, um, well, kind of a extraocular one on the cornea. We've talked a lot about the cornea, so at this point in juncture, we should have a pretty good understanding of how important this cornea is and exactly... Uh, how important it is to us as opticians because you know of all the structures of the eye this is the one that we deal with the most right we see it uh, we are essentially experts in refraction or at least we're working our way towards being and uh, the cornea is the primary refractive element of the eye the we fit contact lenses most of us right so we're fitting the contact lens directly on the cornea so it's it stands to reason that we should be, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna use the word corneal expert because that is a designation that is, that is significantly more appropriate for certain professionals, namely uh, ophthalmologists who have specialized in the cornea. So let's not call ourselves corneal specialists. However, we should be well-versed in the cornea if we're going to be doing our job effectively. We're gonna jump through a handful of corneal dysfunctions. There are many, many more. Uh, in my time working in ophthalmology, I have had the privilege of working with many corneal specialists who deal primarily with the cornea. That's all they deal with. And there are hundreds of different conditions that affect the cornea. What? And we're not going to go through all of those. We could basically do an entire course on the cornea. What we're going to focus on today are the most common ones things that you should be able to recognize, things that you should be understand why they're a problem, um, and more, most importantly, things that you, um, here, how to put it, we want to know what normal looks like, and we want to be able to recognize when things aren't normal. We don't have to diagnose. We just have to, you can, but in this, you know, by, by studying this stuff, you may have an idea of what it is. It doesn't even matter at the end of the day. If you know what's not normal, you can be extremely effective at your job. Enough said. All right, let's start taking a look at some of these things and uh, have brief discussions about what they are. All right, so we will see here, first one, you notice, right, let's get the pen out. I'm gonna have to pick a color here. I think white might work the best. So you'll notice that, okay, what's not normal about this? Well, the cornea is supposed to be a smooth, clear surface. And here, that is not smooth and clear. You've got a big, big ripple. And what is this? Well, this is a corneal abrasion. This is actually an extremely significant corneal abrasion where you could tell the epithelium is like crumpled and it's down into Bowman's uh, membrane, sorry, Bowman's layer and maybe even Desmond's membrane. This is a significant uh, laceration. Okay. So what a corneal abrasion is, is a scratch, <clears throat> excuse me, leading to pain, photophobia, blurred vision, redness, and inflammation. Minor forms will heal on their own, but deeper ones may result in scarring. This would likely result in scarring. It is a doozy, all right? However, pretty easy, right? We see that um, this does not look normal, and then we guess at what it is, but it doesn't really matter. We just know it's not normal. Now, this, um, a lot of corneal abrasions are going to be much more minor than this. Like, this one can literally be seen by looking at it. Not usually the case. Usually what's going to happen is you're going to get little scratches whoops, little scratches on the surface like this, and you won't be able to see it. People will still have these, these symptoms of pain, photophobia, blurred vision, whatnot. However, it's not until you instill fluorescein, okay, uh, a dye that we're going to talk about more when we start talking about contact lens um, diagnostics. When you put the dye in, we put fluorescein, it will stain these abrasions, and then you could really see them. It's rare to have one so significant that you see this huge laceration like this. But Hey, we're showing, while we're showing things, uh, may as well show a doozy, right? So remember, corneal abrasion, laceration, scratch, cut, just basically damage to the front surface, usually mechanical, 
you know, from an injury uh, can also be due to dryness, could be due for, to a number of reasons. However, it is a scratch or, an, or a laceration on the cornea. Moving on. Uh, all right, so if you look here, what we're centered on here is this general area here, okay? And these are stains that there's been, and you can see over here, right there, you see that yellowish dye? This person has been fluorescent. So <clears throat> some of these kind of little marks here, which look a little bit like abrasions, right? They are being marked here by the dye. So keratitis is the inflammation of the cornea. And it's actually, keratitis is very much secondary to things like abrasions and ulcers and whatnot. It's basically there's damage and the body is trying to repair, okay? Uh, it can be caused by minor injury, overwear of contact lenses, or infections for bacteria, virus, fungi, or parasite. Basically, the cornea is compromised and it is um, trying to repair itself. So these here are little ulcers or abrasions on it, more, more ulceration, uh, sorry, these here, okay, right here. And this cloudiness, that's what we call edema. And so that's swelling of the cornea, very, very common with keratitis. So simple, simple way of looking at this, the cornea is compromised, could be due to abrasion, could be due to the other things we mentioned. It is swelling and getting inflamed because of this. Uh, and it's a natural response to the body. Just like if we bump our elbow, our elbow is gonna swell and get inflamed. Well, it just so happens that this is a transparent media where we can actually see things happen a little bit more. Keratitis is extremely, extremely common. Um, and you'll also notice a lot of injection here, okay? The blood vessels in the conjunctiva are very inflamed because they're all linked. They look at here, very, very inflamed, right? And everything's kind of bleeding into each other. Not bleeding, but like, you know, blending. Very, you know, the, everything's very much linked. So anyways, this is keratitis. You will see keratitis at some point in your career. Moving on. All right, so dry eye syndrome. Now, the cornea itself is, looks pretty good, right? But look at all this redness here, right? All here, all this redness. This could be so many different things, right? Now, this image is not like hallmark um, dry eye syndrome. However, this redness in the conjunctiva definitely is because if the cornea is dry, there's a high likelihood that the conjunctiva is also dry, okay? So that's kind of why this is kind of a hallmark sign um, that, you know, that, sorry, hallmark sign. This could be, Redness and injection in the conjunctiva could be a number of things. However, it is often associated with dry eye as well. Where you would really see dry eyes um, is in staining, right? If we put fluorescein in here, you would see that there would probably be a whole bunch of, almost like dry skin, speckles all over the place. There's also a concept of SPK, which is small in, uh, inflammatory cells. However, you'd have speckling all over here with, I should have done it in green because it would actually show up in green, but you get the point. Now, if we're just going to read what the dry eye syndrome is, is the eye produces few or lower quality tears uh, and is unable to keep the surface lubricated, resulting in burning, excess tearing, discharge, pain, and redness. No dry eye syndrome, no the symptoms, no the uh, manifestation because dry eye syndrome is extremely important. It is also a very, very common thing that you're going to see all the time, especially in contact lens um, practices. Uh, this one, all right, so you should know this one. This is a side view of the, um, of the cornea. Normal corneas would look, a, oh, sorry, that's not normal. But anyways, I can't do it. Oh, that's not too bad. So that would be a normal cornea. And look at the difference here, right? Like, what is this? So that is a cornea that is bulging outward. So this is very, very indicative of keratoconus. So that is the progressive thinning of the cornea. Uh, most prevalent in teenagers and adults in their 20s causes the cornea to bulge outwards from and form a round and cone shape resulting in drastic decrease in visual acuity. Absolutely. <clears throat> so I actually had the privilege of specializing in, carot uh, in keratoconus in my time in op ophthalmology. Um, I assisted and I managed patients and assisted in the treatment of keratoconus. We're not going to go too deep into that right now. However, this is a very, very common um, condition. It is manageable. However, it can be difficult and uh, it has a significant effect, effect on vision because we know that the curvature of the cornea is responsible for its power. And if the curvature is all messed up, it causes super high 
refractive error and very, very high and very important to realize this irregular astigmatism. And if we remember when we talked about astigmatism, regular astigmatism, even if it's high, can be corrected with lenses. Irregular astigmatism cannot be corrected with lenses because it just means that you know, unlike having like one curvature this way and one curvature this way, it is very asymmetric and lenses cannot correct that. Interestingly, uh, RGPs, rigid gas permeable lenses can actually uh, correct, a st uh, sorry, keratoconus. And the reason is, is because it's not necessarily the lens curvature itself, but rather the tear lens. So we call it a TL that is going to correct it. Something we're going to touch more in the contact lens course. And again, I don't want to go too deep into this. However, um, keratoconus, very, very common, very difficult to see. Like this is an advanced case and you'd have to look at the patient from the side. There's actually another thing called Munson signs. I'll write it over here. So Munson, uh, M-U-N, Munson's sign is basically when the person looks down, um, the lower lid will take the shape of the cone so you can actually see like a bulging. Um, anyways, that should be enough for keratoconus, very common. Uh, degenerative, you can't just catch it. It is a genetic uh, condition um, and it's found a lot in young men, actually. Uh, and certain cultural uh, backgrounds, too, sometimes uh, will have uh, a little bit more of a likelihood, like Middle Eastern, African, um, that, you know, it's, it, there's certain genetic disorders that follow certain cultures. But nonetheless, very common and something you should know about. And moving on, all right, so again, we've got a head on of the, we've got a head on of the cornea and you could see, uh, I don't know if white's gonna be the best color here. Let's go baby uh, green. So you could see a significant amount of clouding here, right? So we have Fuchs dystrophy. Now this is an interesting one. This is less common. This is the genetic dis disorder, uh, which slowly progressive disease that usually affects both eyes, caused by the gradual de uh, deterioration of cells in the corneal endothelium. The gradual death of endothelial cells caused the cornea to swell and vision to become blurred. Very, very interesting, right? So we got the cornea, one, two, three. Oh boy, that's horrible, right? But anyways, when we look at the cornea from the top, so the top is the epithelium, right? And then the bottom is the endothelium. And then you've got, you know, Bowman's layer, Decimus memory, the stroma, everything in there. But what we're worried about here is the endothelium. The cells in the endothelium start to die off. And if you remember from our discussion of the cornea, what does the endothelium do? It pumps water, H2O, out. All right, that is its primary purpose, to pump water out. If these cells die, water is not getting pumped out and things swell. You'll see the haze, right, all over the place. Haze like this is indicative of too much water. Now, Fuchs dystrophy can be very, very problematic uh, because of the swelling, people can never see well. Um, there's a number of uh, treatments that are done with this from stents to all the way to a full corneal transplant. So this is no joke, it's no messing around. Um, now, is this picture like automatically going to say, oh, this is Fuchs dystrophy? No, we know that this is basically edema. Right? I'm gonna write this down. So edema, which is a fancy word for swelling. That's all you need to realize when you look at this. This is swelling, so it could be from injury, it could be from infection, it could be from a number of things, uh, even from surgery. However, in this particular case, it's from Fuchs dystrophy, but what I want you to remember the most is that this is what edema looks like, all right? All right, good enough, moving on. Oh, look at this, right? That is a mess. So again, head-on vision of the cornea. And what is this? All of these weird, almost looks like flaking skin, right? And in a way, it kind of is. So this is called MAPDOP dystrophy. And this is basically a uh, dysfunction of the corneal epithelium. So the basement membrane of the epithelium develops abnormal, uh, sorry, develops abnormally and forms folds in the tissue, which look like continents or MAP and, or sometimes even fingerprints. We, you know, you'll see, uh, I don't know if I can do this, but it's almost like things like this that form, you know what, that did that a little bit better than I thought it would. Kind of like the same color as the um, as the ones we see here, the white whitish stuff, but it almost forms, sometimes it's called fingerprint dystrophy. Um, these symptoms, of course, include blurred vision, pain, photophobia, and tearing, because the epithelium, two reasons, first of all, vision is because the epithelium is no longer clear. Uh, you know, you want, you need a clear 
cornea to see well, um, the, the blurred vision, sorry, the pain and photophobia is because most of the nerves are found in the epithelium of the cornea. And if all of these things break up, it's like open sores, it's like little wounds, right? Um, and it can be very, very uncomfortable. This again is a, um, well, it's a number, you know, it can be a genetic disorder. Sometimes people uh, who've had recurrent corneal erosions, things, you know, um, symptoms of dry eyes and things like that, it can mess up uh, the, the tissue of the epithelium of the cornea and can actually cause this. Uh, I've even seen people post-surgically uh, develop things like this. So it's something that it's not super common and it's not super rare either. Um, any type of dystrophy. So important to realize that this concept of dystrophy or map dot or fingerprint, this is what corneal dystrophy looks like. There, there's ABMD as well. Okay, so ABMD. Uh, anterior basement membrane dystrophy. All these dystrophies, they all look somewhat like this. Basically, this map dot is a specific pattern, and so is fingerprint, but dystrophies of the cornea look like this. Um, and again, again, all we care about is that this don't look normal. So you see something like this, uh, it's definitely not normal, and that's the, that's the core root of the person's problems. Oh, this is this one's extremely easy to uh, distinguish, <laughs> and this one's extremely advanced. All right, so this is a pterygium. F funny writing. Just remember how to write pterygium, right? Silent P. There it is, the silent P. I'm gonna change to something a little bit better color here, but uh, pinkish triangular tissue growth on the cornea, usually associated with chronic exposure to UV light. Um, people suffering from poverty, you know, living in impoverished countries that are very close to the equator or very, very southern in Africa and, and different parts of the world are more prone to problems like this. And this is basically a weird dysfunction of the cells of the conjunctiva that start to blend from the limbus and grow onto the cornea. Now, you will see this in North America and Europe. However, it is rare that it gets all the way to here infringing on the pupil. Most people, it'll stop somewhere around here and it's benign, it's not a huge deal. If it becomes a concern where the patient is, uh, it's usually more of a, an aesthetic concern, if it becomes a concern where the patient is complaining that it's ugly and they don't like it, it can be surgically repaired, but not without risk and not without uh, you know, significant recovery. And most ophthalmologists don't want to touch it because they'll say, you know, risk outweighs benefit. All right. However, in this case, it's infringing on the pupil. This is vision altering. This is bad news. Uh, this can cause blindness because if it, if this thing were to continue all the way here and completely go over the pupil, which I mean, I, it pretty much has, this is bad news, right? So if I don't think you're ever going to see a pterygium, uh, this advanced, however, Hey man, if, uh, it, you know, you, you might, um, but just so you know, pterygiums are not great. It's very important for people to wear sunglasses and protect their the tissue of the eye because you don't want it to progress to this point. And it's definitely something that, you know, if a doctor notices, notices it, they'll advise the patient the same way. Um, now, this didn't cover all of the uh, corneal conditions. Those are the ones I wanted you to really know, though, because it covers like broad spectrum kind of stuff, right? Like that we talked about the abrasions and the different things like that because secondary to the abrasion, there was edema. I want you to know what edema looks like. I wanted you to look like, see what a corneal dystrophy. We didn't even talk about viruses and, 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 um, and, and bacterial infections. We even talk about ulcers because these are all things that kind of look alike. Uh, an, an ulcer looks a lot like an abrasion, right? Um, a bacterial, cor uh, sorry, bacterial, fungal, viral, they all look very much to keratitis, right? So these are all things I wanted you to understand that this doesn't look normal. We could have gone all day on this and I don't want to do that, right? So just understand that you need to know what a normal corneal looks like and then, uh, you know, recognize when it doesn't look that way. So remember, clear cornea, vital for, vi clear cornea, vital for vision. If your cornea is not clear for whatever reason, if there's things, you know, if there's defects on it or if it's totally swollen, it's no good. And it's, uh, it's not going to be beneficial for the patient and it needs to be addressed. Uh, secondary edema can cause blurred vision. So remember a lot of these conditions will cause edema uh, and vision will be blurred. Even if <clears throat> the 
uh, let's say abrasion or ulcer or whatever it may be is far off from the, the visual axis, uh, any kind of resulting edema will result in lousy vision. So the cornea needs to be detergescent. Remember that. Deter. Deter. Gen, I don't know if I spelled that. Detergent, right? Detergent, that's my, that might not even be right. Anyways, it's the concept. Relatively dehydrated, no, very low water contact. The, the, the moment water comes into the tissue, it's bad news, all right? Some pathologies will eliminate contact lens candidacy. Yeah, of course. This should, this should be a no-brainer, right? If the cornea is inflamed, if the cornea, if you have edema, uh, if you have an open wound, should you be putting a contact lens on that? Heck no. With the very small and, you know, um, the exception that sometimes a contact lens is used like a Band-Aid on an open wound, but it's not your job to do that, all right? The ophthalmologist will do that um, to protect that surface and help it heal. However, you know, for our purposes, you should not be putting any corneal pathology, really, with the exception to minor pterygiums, uh, you shouldn't be putting a contact lens on. Anyways, we're gonna go into super detail in the contact lens course. However, since we're talking about corneal pathologies, we may as well just kind of hint at it now. There's very few corneal problems where I would say it's A-OK -okay to put um, a contact lens on that. And what, cause why, why would you do it? You know, you correct the vision with glasses. Uh, oh, and I guess the other one is keratoconus. We do use contact lenses and keratoconus. But anyways, any kind of like acute or inflammatory problems, heck no, we're not putting any contact lenses on that. Um, suspect corneal pathology should always be suspected or suspect, sorry, you know, just in pronunciation, suspect corneal pathology should always be referred. So here is, the take home message that kind of relates to this, we're gonna arrow down. All right, no normal. Okay, so if you know what normal looks like, then uh, if it's not normal, not normal equals refer. And you know what? Maybe sometimes you refer things that didn't need to be referred. Um, and you know, Maybe if you do it too often, you'll get told, like, listen, you don't need to be sending all of this stuff. But you know what? Better be safe than sorry. And especially with the cornea, if the cornea is inflamed, if everything's ugly and everything's, you know, I don't, I don't see any problem with referring all, even a pterygium, right? If the patient hasn't seen the doctor in a while and they have a pterygium, send them. It's not normal. So send them over. Um, there's nothing wrong. You shouldn't be ashamed, even if you're wrong. Uh, you know, you'll be wrong in your, 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 I don't even want to call it diagnosis, in your hypothesis, you might be wrong. However, you're not wrong in the sense that it's not normal, right? So anyways, that, we've gone a little long on the cornea, but it, it's not a big deal because cornea is super important. So if we're going to go along on anything, it should be this. Uh, but that should do it. You know, if you're interested in more, do your research. You know, we just talked about it. There's hundreds and hundreds of corneal issues that could be out there. And the more you know, the better you'll be. And don't worry, we're going to touch a heck of a lot more on this when we start talking about co contact lens pathology and contact lens stuff uh, because, well, it's super, super important. All right, I think that should do it for this one. Let's uh, focus on the next one.